This is the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast from Advanta IRA, where we show you how to explore investments beyond Wall Street and open your eyes to new options for your portfolio. It's time to take control and give yourself the freedom to choose where you invest your money. Welcome to another edition of the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. My name is Alex Perney. Today, we'll be learning everything you wanted to know about investing in sports franchises a little bit later on. But right now on the download, Chipotle was hit with a $20 million fine in labor violations probe in New York City. However, it doesn't seem to have dampened the investor spirit for the burrito company as the share price is still up almost 1% a day. And surprising to me, I had no idea that Chipotle shares were so expensive. It is now trading at $1,637.23 as of the recording of this podcast. It's... um. It is quite the uh, the pension for burritos on Wall Street right now um, with a $1,600 share price. You could certainly buy a lot of them for that. Tech companies are reeling after a five-day rally on the news from chip manufacturer Micron, Micron being one of the larger chip and memory module manufacturers in the world, uh, stating that the supply is far outside the actual demand for semiconductors, which is kind of a... Uh, a big switch from what we had where we had no supply and extremely high demand. So it's kind of interesting to see this paradigm shift a little bit, uh, which is not good news for uh, tech manufacturers or tech companies in general. Uh, The Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, another thing I learned existed today, uh, fell almost 4.5% on trading on this news alone. So uh, the semiconductor and the tech companies were, again, on a little bit of a rally there. Um, The NASDAQ being a very tech-heavy market index, uh, kind of riding about a five-day rally from last week, but that kind of all came crashing down, uh, you know, using the term crash lightly, uh, down on Monday and Tuesday of this week. So it'll be interesting to see where it goes from there as, again, we've seen kind of a paradigm shift on what is going on with tech. Now, most tech companies are still reeling this year, even though they had a bit of a rally last week. Most large companies, uh, such as Google's Alphabet, are trading down well over a uh, quarter of what they what they were trading at earlier this year. So seeing 25 to almost 45% dip in share prices is not uncommon amongst no, most tech companies right now. Bitcoin is also trading down a little bit. Cryptocurrencies were doing a little bit better last week. However, the labor, sorry, the Federal Reserve and the chairman of the Fed is expected to put out a CPI or Consumer Pricing Index report tomorrow on 810, August 10th, 2022. That is great, generally expected to show much higher levels of inflation than we're previously anticipated. And Bitcoin is trading down on that almost four and a half percent in its largest single day drop since June of this year. Uh, now it's really going to be interesting to see exactly how much the inf- the inflationary index is gone up. We did see a 75 basis point uh, increase in the federal lending rate the other the last meeting that the Fed had, and they're signaling that there might be some more to come this year. So it's very interesting to see with 30 uh, year. Uh, mortgages being almost, you know, five, six percent right now, uh, how much higher this can really go and if it's actually going to do anything to stymie inflation. So with that being said, Bitcoin, inflation, Bitcoin going down, inflation being high, uh, it's kind of anyone's guess as to where some of these markets are going to go. But it'll be interesting to see exactly what the inflationary markers are and how bad they are when we get that report, probably around lunch tomorrow, Eastern Standard Time. And some interesting, or I guess some not so, I, maybe interesting is the wrong, wrong word to use, but international to use, Cuban Fuel Depot was struck by lightning last week, resulting in a fire that they only just got under control over the weekend that was at the the country's only crude oil reserve and refinery plant. Now, this has already stricken a country that is seeing incredibly high inflation rates with almost 50% inflationary measures just this year alone caused a shutdown of the country's sole oil refinery and one of their largest power plants. So things really not going too great in Cuba right now. Uh, you know, wishing them all the best on hoping that they can get this uh, production back up and running. But uh, in a country with relatively um, low infrastructure for this kind of stuff already, to see such a huge setback in the energy sector of a country that basically imports all of its own or all of its uh, fuel for energy production, this is uh, just kind of catastrophic to their to their infrastructure and their uh, 
their grid of electricity. So hopefully we don't see uh, too much more coming out of this and they can get that refinery back up and running uh, because the Cuban people are certainly going to need power with the uh, upcoming hurricane season, just kind of getting into full swing. Now, with a little bit of positive news, I know we've been kind of talking uh, around on some rather doom and gloom when it comes to the market side. You know, it certainly is something to be said that it's looking all signs being pointing to that a recession coming in. But for those of that us that are invested in transportation and shipping companies, they are set to report a surprising profits report a little bit later this month that is going to supposedly exceed the previous highs by almost 73%. So shipping companies are certainly seeing a big boom right now. So for people looking for some investments that are maybe outside the typical realm of what uh, you're normally looking at, looking to shipping and uh, import export companies might be a good play right now as they are really kind of hitting it out of the park with their um, their current profits and the uh, expected projections going on through the end of the year. This has been The Download. Today on the What Is, What Is Alpha? No, it's not just a term for the first letter of the Greek alphabet or the most powerful wolf in a pack. Alpha, as it relates to investing, is a term used to describe an investment strategy's ability to beat the market or its edge. Alpha is thus often referred to as excess return or abnormal rate of return, which refers to the idea that markets are efficient and so there is no way to systematically earn returns that exceed the broad markets as a whole. Alpha is often used in conjunction with beta, the measure of volatility or risk, in evaluating a company or a share's potential for earnings. Hi, and welcome to another edition of the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. My name is Alex Perney, and today we are very excited to welcome in Justin Papadakis, uh, who is uh, definitely going to be bringing us an interesting perspective on some very uh, alternative investing, uh, especially with the lens of something that many people might have heard of, and that's uh, sports franchises. Uh, Justin's putting together a new soccer league in the United States, and uh, we're going to kind of be going over kind of how he um, you know, his his uh, career arc that got him here uh, into starting a new sports uh, franchise and uh, and league and also kind of uh, what it means to invest in something like that. I know we've all heard of, uh, you know, the uh, the billionaires buying uh, large sports clubs, uh, the Roman Abramoviches, the Paul Allens and the like. Uh, but uh, it definitely kind of trickles down into more uh, attainable aspects of uh, sports franchise investing and ownership as well. So, Justin, thank you very much for being on with us today. Uh, thank, thanks for having me. Looking forward to the conversation today. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, give us a little bit of a background on yourself. I know this probably wasn't uh, your first uh, crack at, um, you know, a, a professional trajectory. I understand a little bit of background. You had some uh, real estate experience, which is uh, what we do a lot of here at Advanta as well. So tell us a little bit about yourself. So like most of my colleagues here at the league office, former player and the thing that we're most excited about um, are two things. One is really increasing the value of our uh, our investors' assets and growing the game of soccer, uh, principally through um, creating first-class franchises around the country and having great fan experiences um, and great opportunities uh, to showcase you know professional soccer around around the country. And so. I, I came uh, up through uh, the, the, the beautiful game. Uh, my, my dad, who, who is our CEO, um, he, you know, came immigrated from, from Greece to Canada. And soccer is what gave, you know, him uh, a career. Um, through, played professionally in the old uh, NASL, uh, then went to law school. And then when the opportunity came, came around, uh, the N- Nike who bought Umbro uh, put the league up for sale and it was a small, had a couple professional teams, but, you know, just for context, uh, teams were about $50,000, you know, back in 2008. Um, and now our team sell for 50 to $70 million. So it's been a, um, it's been a fun ride. 
And I think most excitingly, we are still in early days uh, of 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 the league, even though we've been around for uh, 10 plus years. Uh, now we have, uh, which I'm sure we'll talk about, uh, several billion dollars right now of active state development and another another two billion coming by 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 the end of the year. Um, so the league's come a long way. Professional soccer's come a long way. And I think along with that, um, uh, of course, investor interest in professional sports and in particular soccer um, is now really getting intense. And so looking forward to break, breaking that down for you uh, over the course of this podcast. Yeah, absolutely. So in general, and and I only kind of know you know, just the headlines of seeing, you know, when you talk, when you hear about uh, investments in sports franchises, you know, let take, you know, the, you know, large European soccer clubs, you know, you hear about these billionaires just coming in buying teams and it's kind of like a, you know, all or, or nothing shot with those. And, and you do hear about uh, collectives of people coming in and buying franchises. But when you're talking about, um, you know, like you said, the amount of money you have is, you know, probably about the net worth of, of one large soccer club um, in, in Europe. So when you're talking about stuff like that, obviously the price points are, you know, a lot more attainable for people that are looking to invest uh, in that stuff. So maybe let's talk about how sports investing works in general in the larger context, and then also specifically to how you are looking to acquire investment and what it looks like to invest in a level that um, uh, USL uh, is is operating in. So the way that I think we approach sports investing, um, and now you see that you know, on um, across the top five leagues as well, is we combine the alternative asset class of sports uh, with, you know, more traditional asset class of real estate. So the different approach that we've taken is to go into markets at, at the league level. And generally speaking, we'll, we'll go in and we're working about 40 markets right now. And we'll structure the stadium and usually a uh, stadium and entertainment district development. Uh, we'll assemble the land. We will uh, you know, start working on, on zoning and entitlements, et cetera. And then we'll bring, um, we'll select an ownership group uh, to then take the stadium and the development of the team uh, and, uh, and, and take it forward from there. And so the, what's exciting, as you mentioned, you know, USL, you know, investments. And I think it's so much more a applicable to the general audience because uh, you have a couple billionaires that, you know, will buy a Chelsea once, you know, once every couple of years. Uh, but so many more investors can have access to the alternative asset class of, of sports um, and, you know, principally soccer through through the USL. And so, that again, when you the the real estate component not only improves the economics, uh, but it also improves the the sports side uh, because you have a stadium that has entertainment options around it, which increases attendance, which increases commercial opportunities, um, and it makes it makes the whole project work. So they're really kind of yin and yang, uh, symbiotic. And that's how we've impro uh, approached, uh, you know, sports investing. And then there's enhancements with opportunity zones um, and other uh, in incentive-based programs that can further improve the the, the economics uh, for sports investors. And the last thing I'll say is, because of the kind of the law of large numbers, um, you have tr trophy assets like Chelsea and the Broncos that have traded you know, for four or five billion, we really view our teams. And when we select our investors, we really want this to be an investment first. And so when you look at the kind of growth trajectory on a percentage basis and investors, like I'm sure the, the, the ones listening on, on your show, um, whether ultimately it's a return on investment, right? So if you're starting out at a $20 million basis or a $5 billion basis, at the end, it doesn't really matter. It what really matters is the return um, over over your whole period, and we believe, and I can go through uh, with you, you know, why that is. That we offer, and we have a ten year track record to show this, of 
year over year uh, above market returns. Um, and we think uh, that, you know, the next 10 years will be significantly larger than the prior 10 years because of the revenue verticals that we uh, didn't have until now uh, in kind of phase two of our growth. Sure. So let's kind of go back to the 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 real estate aspect because that's you know what we're really steeped in now, with regard to that initial kind of develop. So when you go into this new initial market, are you looking to essentially buy and acquire like an existing stadium structure, or is it something where you're going in with more of a development mindset? Um, and then further to that, are you structuring these things like uh, kind of? And I've seen this done with um, uh, franchising things and, and different developments where it'll be kind of like a real estate arm, let's say, uh, kind of like a Reg A or a Reg D uh, offering where you bring in limited partners to kind of develop a certain project and then have like an exit strategy with the sale of that limited partnerships assets into, let's say, the ownership or the actual club level. Uh, get into that a little bit. Um, how exactly are you looking at it? Is it more of kind of a development on the front end or is it looking for more of like the existing structure and then improve? Improvements, or is it kind of a mixture of both and just depends on the actual market you're looking at? With some very limited exceptions, we are building uh, from the ground up. So, you know, for your listeners, I'd say how we approach it. Um, and I think, you know, I was just in the battery for uh, in, in Atlanta for a same conference this week. How the Braves and other teams are approaching it is a similar way is to go identify you know, between 20 and 60 acres and build a new ground up development. And so that way um, our team can capture the holistic ec economics uh, because the stadium is the anchor for the project. And so you can take, you know, C minus real estate and make it B plus. You can take B plus and make it A minus because you immediately bring critical mass. And I don't think it's a perfect analogy, but it's close because I come from a retail real estate background. It's kind of like the old department store for a mall, right, where you needed that mall to bring everything around it. Now, especially with, re you know, traditional retail, uh, you know, in a very downward trajectory, developments, in, in our view, are really going to be centered around entertainment. When people go out, they aren't going out now to buy something. They're really going out uh, for an experience. And so what we try to do is create these experience uh, entertainment districts centered around a stadium uh, that we can have men's soccer, women's soccer, lacrosse, rugby, concerts, festivals, et cetera. And we really think about how to design and program our stadiums to bring thousands of people there uh, we uh, every day um, so that you have a constant flow of people to uh, serve the the wider uh, experience district. Gotcha. So a bit of the uh, field of dreams approach to it. If you build it, they will come uh, in so far as that it's, um, you know, the attraction of the experience, not so much of the um, the end retail. And, and I like that analogy. I think it definitely fits for this. Now, in that kind of development phase, are you going out as a company with your kind of own capital? And obviously, you don't have to get drilled down too far into the specifics of it. Or is it kind of one thing where you're putting together individual projects as, let's say, individual investment opportunities for people? Or are you trying to develop this yourselves and then turn around and get it out to the investor? Like how to exactly, you know, if someone's looking at this saying, okay, that sounds like an interesting avenue of kind of twofold, you know, the development aspect and then also the end use, the end use down the road of the revenue generation from that. Um, where does the investment kind of come in from the outside investor? Um, and then what does that look like um, as far as a structure standpoint? So we have a couple of different uh, scenarios. Again, we're working on 40 projects uh, right now. So uh, there's, there's a spectrum. The end result though is the same, is that we want our, our team ownership group to realize the economics of the, de of the ultimate development. Um, and so we leave economics on the table, uh, but we see that as um, ways for our overall investment group at the team level, because they're gonna ultimately own and run the team. We want them to have those economics, uh, and it's important that that's the case. So in old model of stadiums, they were either out 
um, in surrounded by hundreds of acres of parking with nothing around them, or a lot of them were in downtown locations where you had fragmented ownership around them in bars and restaurants. The so the 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 first example um, makes it a very difficult for the fan experience unless you're doing like the NFL model where you only have eight eight or nine games. Um, the downtown uh, project um, is suboptimal uh, because the, there's a lot of examples where the programming of the venue um, might be a break-even proposition, but the more people we can bring down, it really benefits the surrounding businesses. So to have them join together and think about, okay, we might want to go spend a little money to bring a Premier League team over for a friendly uh, during the season, because even if we break even on the game, but we bring 10,000 people down that are staying in the hotels, that are eating the bar, eating and drinking the bars and restaurants, there's benefit there. And so in most cases, the league will go in and we'll, we'll assemble it and then we'll turn it over to our ownership. In some cases, the local development group has identified and assembled the land and then they come and acquire the franchise um, and use that as the catalyst for the uh, for for the project and so we have both examples um, and can walk you through you know examples of both uh, but a great representation of it um, and it's the first strategy uh, is in next next Friday um, we are doing the groundbreaking for a 400 plus million dollar uh, development in in Rhode Island and so it's you know it's taking land that's been you know underutilized for decades um, along the river uh, in, in Pawtucket just outside of Providence and really having a transformational development and that's where our owners they they again we want them to view it as an investment first they believe in the investment thesis of sports and third um, that they really care about bringing transformational development, um, jobs and economic impact to their communities. So that's what th those are. Those are our three criteria uh, for you know for for our investment. Gotcha. Now, as far as like the individual investor wanting to come in and saying, okay, you know, this looks like an interesting avenue for me to deploy capital into. Uh, what do the opportunities look like for that? Um, you know, is it something where they come in on your side of things saying, hey, we're interested in the real estate development, or are they kind of, is it all the people, would the investors be coming in on the ownership side and saying, hey, we want to develop a franchise with you? And then it's some type of like, um, you know, kind of like joint growth development that you identify, you know, the uh, obviously the locations. Uh, demographics and everything else like that. Um, what does it look like from the investor side of things coming into the saying, hey, this is interesting um, to, to be able to get involved with something? So our team, we operate a, a franchise model. So the team um, ultimately is owned by a franchise group. Um, and under our model, they keep 100% of their local revenues and we share national revenues. They also will ultimately uh, own and control 100% of the local real estate economics. And so it's that blend, as I mentioned earlier, of your traditional real estate economics plus your sports economics that, um, that the local ownership group uh, will realize 100% of that. We have coordination, uh, of course, because we have expertise in stadium development. We're the largest stadium developer by number in the world by a large margin. Um, and so we have a lot of invest, uh, real estate investment groups that um, a lot of them have real estate backgrounds. They might have land that they want to develop. And so we would work with them on bringing a, uh, a larger franchise group if needed or work on, uh, you know, bringing the whole project together. They would need to acquire the franchise rights. Um, but again, or we can do it and then we'll bring them in at the end. Um, it really works both ways. Um, but what we see and what we're so excited about and is that in the NFL, NBA, those teams are largely set. You have some relocations from time to time, uh, but I'll break our markets into two segments. 
markets kind of 30, 30 through 115 MSAs. No doubt we can come in. And again, we have multiple examples now of being able to come in and put together great real estate stadium anchored projects. And even in markets one through 30, our, our approach will be largely to go around um, uh, around sub markets around the main market and identify opportunities. And in so many markets in these top 30 markets, they've gotten so big and so sprawling that they just naturally create these sub markets around. So if you're looking like at a Fort Worth or Dallas or in Atlanta, you know, you have, you know, Gwinnett and Cobb uh, that the to, for a family to go from, you know, Northeast Gwinnett to downtown, I mean, it's an hour and a half to an hour, 45 minutes. And so we really try to create community driven clubs. And, uh, and, and that's where um, they're, they're, in our experience, there really hasn't been a soccer market versus a non-soccer market. Um, you can take a market like um, Albuquerque, New Mexico, that, you know, and they're very proud of this, that of uh, all your traditional metrics, um, they're, they're last or close to the bottom, household income, population growth, corporate base, et cetera. And they are, um, you know, they're doing 12 plus thousand uh, fans a game. And so soccer is, is here to stay. And, and now it's just bringing uh, great venues and great stadium developments uh, to, you know, to satisfy that demand. Oh, absolutely. And uh, the only thing I will say is I think you were woefully underestimating how long it takes to get from those two points in Atlanta. <laughs> it, the traffic there is missed. We have an office in Atlanta and it's just always a fun to joke about how awful that city is to navigate. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Development in parts of that city um, that can bring different opportunities to people like that aren't, you know, super centrally located because it is such a sprawling metropolis is, is definitely a good example. Now exactly. to kind of look at the, you know, like you said it's, it's a franchise model. So you have mainly in Craig, if I'm wrong, the investors, as far as like, you know, individual investors are coming in on the franchise side, not necessarily in through an offering per se that USL has. You're doing the stadium development, right. franchise development, and the investor that wants to plug their capital in comes in to some type of group or organization or individually on the franchise side, right? So, uh, and again, this is an important a distinction point. So ultimate, so the process would work, again, whether the USL goes in and sets it up in advance or whether the uh, the owner would come with a development site already in place. Either way, our local operator will own the franchise and the development rights. They might subsequently, um, you know, piece out the, the hotel or out parcels or multifamily, but that would be a, a decision solely for the, the group that owns our franchise or, so, or the, the, the soccer team. Um, so the league doesn't retain any future, um, you know, any, any future economics in the, the team or in the, in the development. Okay. Gotcha. Does, that does not. Okay. Gotcha. So for the individual investors coming into this, um, what are kind of, you know, what do you, what are you seeing? Is it people coming in, like just kind of individually saying, Hey, I'd like to do this, or is it more of kind of like um, like organizations or groups that are maybe putting together some type of limited partnership or some type of trust that would, or, or some type of business that would own the franchising rights. Um, Cause obviously, you know, for one person to buy any type of sports franchise, it's a pretty big price tag. Um, you're talking probably millions, if not tens of millions of dollars individually, just to pony up as far as capital. So are you seeing these be kind of uh, a little bit more of a grassroots efforts of like uh, individual like like different individuals coming together as a collective or being taken down uh, individually um, specifically in, in markets. So we have a, we have a, a lot of uh, clubs around the country. So um, there we have situations like where the Spurs and Spurs sports and entertainment that own the NBA team, they, they own our, our team in San Antonio a hundred percent and, and they're a great organization. So that works well in San Antonio. My preference um, is to put together groups, though. And I think we have, you know, such a, I think, now proven track record that finding the money is, is now not an issue. For us now, it's how do we 
curate the, the group um, that really brings together um, not the money, uh, not only the money, but the different relationships. And so by so someone, whether they have experience in finance, real estate, um, consumer products, marketing, et cetera, what we really like to do and we, where we see the best uh, results are when we put together a group of community leaders, men and women, um, black and, 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 and white and Hispanic, right? So we really want diversity within our ownership groups, diversity of ethnicity and diversity of talents. And so that is now our really uh, prime focus is ha and that's where our and our common denominator is that the group really cares about the growth of of their community and so when you use that as a focal point um and you say we are care about the community we also really care about women's sports um we care about you know having you know every match being a two-hour commercial for our city and we can wrap that in in uh, great economics um, and particularly have uh, exposure to an alternative asset class uh, like professional sports, that's, that's where um, uh, the, the groups really come together. And that's, you know, what we really attribute, you know, the, the, the pace of growth of USL to um, because we work for years and putting all those stakeholders together uh, with under that, you know, under that common cause. Sure. Um, now, with regard to kind of, you know, returns and things like that on these, obviously, uh, you know, nothing's guaranteed, you know, everyone invested their own risk, uh, you know, past past returns are not indicative of future uh, returns and, and all the things that make our uh, corporate overlords happy. Uh, but specifically, what does it look like? when someone you know invests in something like this or an ownership group invests like this is it something where people are going to be realizing um you know passive income is it structured more actively um because that's kind of you know at least on the aspect of people that listen to this uh you know we have you know a big thing that we do is you know alternative investing in retirement plans and you know tax avoidance structures and things like that so from the investor side of things, um, what do, how, and is it very kind of between ownership group to ownership group? Are these people like working for these franchises or, you know, the investors working for them and realizing active income? What does it look like when people are receiving back these returns um, as far as uh, what it might look like, um, you know, for the types of revenues that they generate, you know, if you can speak to that, um, what does that look like when it comes back in? Um, how do you know how, how that kind of income is typically classified when investing in sports franchises? So I would characterize it in this way, the USL and I, and I, again, I, I would extend that broadly to the top five leagues, even though they're much more mature businesses uh, than the USL. Um, for us, we see that as the opportunity uh, because your primary drivers of, of revenue in your top five leagues, but are, are very mature, but but encompass a big part of the revenue, media, sports betting, and soccer, this concept of player transfers, which, you know, we, we can talk about. Um, we look at, you know, the merchandising growth potential of, of soccer uh, because of, you know, just our soccer jerseys are fashionable. Um, and the national revenues associated with USL, we are growing at an extremely high rate uh, relative to the other leagues that are more mature and growing at a smaller base, a smaller rate, but on, of course, a much higher rate. And now with our stadium economics um, that we are building 20 to $120 million stadiums, the structural revenue that is derived off those are very favorable uh, given our, our cost structure. Put, that's in addition to the real estate economics uh, that can be derived around the stadium. And then what we're looking at um, and what we're implementing on is what we're building is a platform. Um, the stadium is a platform that we started with men's, uh, men's professional soccer. Um, then we're adding women's professional soccer. And when we look down the line, adding other owned content, whether it's other sports like, like lacrosse 
or or concerts or festivals is how do we program and use and monetize that stadium uh, as the anchor to the project as much as possible. And so from a investor standpoint, I would say um, sports largely, whether it's USL or, or other um, investments, uh, I, I would not say that it's, you know, a retirement uh, investment. Um, I would say it is more of a hybrid from a, a, a venture uh, investment. Um, and, but we, we are trying to, um, you know, not have 5% growth uh, for the next five years or 10 years. We're trying to go from today to hundred, uh, $120 million uh, uh, franchises, again, in addition to the larger real estate economics. And so that the investor profile is, is a very specific profile. You do have to, you know, be um, a high net worth individual, I think, for, for sports to be the right uh, investment uh, for you. Um, but again, we see as in addition to the economics, when we select investors, we are also looking for investors that really want to have a transformational uh, aspect uh, to their communities. Um, because we, we like it when the investor goes to the grocery store and they say, you know, how come you didn't win the game last night, right? That, that is something that um, sports are different uh, from passive investments or, or crypto. Um, there is this big community aspect to owning a professional sports franchise. You are a custodian of the team because it is the community's team uh, ultimately. And so there are other features outside of the economics that I think are unique to sports and that are important for someone considering a sports investment. Sure. And you mentioned player player transfers and stuff. So let's dig into a little bit of the, um, you know, just the operational aspects of this, because I think we've pretty well covered uh, kind of the, uh, you know, the how it kind of structures as far as it works of saying, hey, you know, obviously we want to develop a franchise. What does it look like on the two aspects of the ownership group versus USL's development of uh, property and everything else like that? When it comes to actual, you know, the game itself, so uh, is it basically kind of the same model where players are contracted out, can be traded? Is there any type of thing that y'all are doing different from other uh, sports franchises? Um, you know, the Rays just lost one of our marquee players, a hometown guy, uh, yesterday to a trade, which I was not too happy about. But, um, you know, is, is it something like that where there's any type of uh, divergence from that? Or is that kind of just a generally accepted uh, practice as far as how it, uh, players and talent are um, are acquired and and utilized. Um, you know, not that there's anything particularly wrong with that. Um, you know, it keeps things interesting. But um, how does it work within USL for um, you know player retention, acquisition, and trades and things like that? So I'll start out with a big distinction between soccer and all the other sports in NBA, NFL, MLB, NHL. Uh, teams trade players and trade draft picks. In soccer, you sell or in soccer parlance, transfer players um, to other clubs. And so European transfers can be, you know, are 5, 10, 15, up to $300 million uh, that clubs pay for players that are they're essentially buying their rights to those players and then they pay them a salary. And so for the USL, this is an aspect that's so exciting because when you look back 10 years, the United States arguably, I think has the best athletes in the world. We just haven't developed them right for soccer. And there were structural reasons why that was uh, one, there wasn't enough clubs uh, Two, you know, players largely went to college uh, three, they played on these youth uh, fragmented youth systems uh, that are pay for play. Um, and so that's really, it's changed a lot today and will be very different um, over the next five years where that whole, that that's all changed. And so the, at the USL level, um, looking back five years, we essentially had zero uh, trading uh, player transfer income. And now this year we've uh, hit a milestone with our first $750,000 transfer. And uh, 
we're expecting, you know, hopefully our first seven figure transfer by the end of the year. This, and so think about player tr within a league as like a neighborhood for your house, right? When one house sells for, you know, $750,000, the, the houses around it kind of get repriced relative to their square footage and bedrooms, et cetera. So players within a league um, exist in that same uh, uh, pricing dynamic where now we are producing better players and we have, we're able to price them on a transaction that now players get repriced. The, that, that dynamic is very unique for soccer because soccer is the only sport that has a direct connection between the pro and the, and the youth, which are called academies. And so now our teams are, they have their own academy that they're developing players every year. And then we're going into an increasing uh, and proven transfer market from USL that the teams then keep 100% of, of that revenue. And so it's an exciting addition to our revenue streams. And for our clubs, 750,000 a million, and again, we're, we're, we're going up very dramatically, those dramatically enhance the, the P&L and the long-term valuation. Uh, because when you look out over 20, 30 years, the future uh, revenue streams that can be associated with that if we start to get to the levels uh, around Europe are dramatic. Sure. So now th that all I think makes pretty good sense, but from the aspect, like you said, you know, you are in a competitive market. There are certainly other, you know, competing leagues out there. Um, the only one I know of, let's say MLS or let's say premier league in Europe, what kind of um, issues do you have or how are you trying to like, you know, it's, it's great. You know, you, to, to get good talent obviously is, is awesome, but what you want to do is try to attract more good talent, not just have it be kind of a stepping stone for a player to come in and say, okay, you know, they're fantastic. And then they go play in, you know, another league. So what are some of the aspects of your organization that try to, um, you know, alleviate that? Is it just trying to produce a better product with more attendance and more revenue to be able to retain these players? Are there certain protections that are built into structures, um, at least with how contracts and everything work to keep, um, you know, kind of mass migration happening to a, another league, not to say that any other league is better or worse, but, um, you know, certainly, like you said, you know, coming from, you know, where you're at, you don't want someone, you know, a great player just automatically, you know, getting, you know, some stardom here and then going to play for Chelsea or something. Um, you know, you want to have that kind of community driven development where it's people are going to be, um, you know, really invested and involved in the production and the players that are playing for these, um, you know, different markets. So uh, how, would, how does that exactly work? Or is that kind of a concern um, that you have and, and what might be going on to try to uh, help prevent that? So just to set the table a little bit, unlike the sports, the, the NBA, NFL, you're kind of your big five. In soccer, the, U the USL and even the MLS are not even in the top five, six, or seven leagues in the world, okay, from a, from a money standpoint um, in terms of uh, player salaries. Sure. So players – will go ultimately where the highest paid is, uh, where, where the highest market is. And so for soccer and for the USL, that is a very positive dynamic, right? Where we do have these community aspects where, you know, our teams can sign academy contracts for five players. And so if you're really good 15, 16, 17 year old, you can even maintain your college eligibility and get minutes on, uh, on, the USL's team and play on ESPN, play in front of 10,000 people. Um, but the goal is, of course, to for our clubs is to have a community dream club, but also a dual goal to also be very financially uh, sustainable. And so unlike the other sports where you trade players, for our teams, if they can develop a player and then transfer them to Germany – and then our club, you know, you take that that transfer dollars, take that million dollars, and then invest it back into higher, better facilities and coaches uh, to keep developing more players. That is a system that is advantageous for their community because that money can get invested back. 
and it's advantageous for the player because then that player um, will go to your to principally to Europe, but they could go to Mexico, they could go to the MLS, they could go to Asia, um, and play at you know uh, at a league that has that gets you know that has higher salaries uh, and or um, you know viewed as one of the top you know two or three leagues in the world. And so it's really good for all parties and it's very distinctive um, that soccer is very distinct in that way from the other sports in the United States. I think that's kind of really interesting point because I I wouldn't really think of it like that because, you know, when you trade someone out in, um, you know, let's say, you know, the NFL, you know, basically you free up money that you didn't have to pay them. You don't necessarily always get paid per se. I mean, obviously everything changes. Sometimes there is a payout, um, you know, there's draft picks, there's negotiations, but um, from the aspect of what you're saying is that it's not necessarily a bad thing and can actually be a good thing because if, you know, you have the next, and forgive me, I know very few large professional soccer players, let's say you have the next Ronaldo come to your club and then you get the exposure and you get a big transfer fee for that. You can then in turn take that specific you know, revenue dollars that you get from that in the nature of how, for lack of a word term, trades work in within soccer to then, you know, put it into development, put it into your pipeline of new players, to your academies, to your actual product that you're selling. And then, you know, ultimately, you know, reinvest that revenue into getting more good players. And then, you know, ultimately, you know, that will raise the value and the profitability and X, Y, and Z down the road for the actual club. I think that um, in and of itself is something, you know, I like to learn something new every day. And I think that's really kind of interesting of, you know, how that would actually work because it just kind of is very antithetical to what I know of, you know, following, like you said, the big five in the U S you know, it's NFL, NHL, MLB, and NBA for me. That's, you know, kind of my, you know, sports, uh, if you will. So um, yeah, really interesting. Um, You know, with that said, we're kind of coming up a little bit on how long I like to keep these at about 40 minutes. Um, You know, we've, we've touched on the investment, you know, the kind of the two pronged investment approach from the development and also the, uh, the ownership side on the franchising and how that works with the community development and the real estate development, Um, you know, basic structures of how kind of players work within USL and trades and stuff like that. Is there anything that you think that we haven't really hit on as far as, you know, again, the alternative investing nature of doing uh, sports franchising, sports franchise and sports investment that you think might be interesting for people to hear about? So for for me, um, it it's such an exciting place uh, because you have such a big community impact. In my 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 old company, we would build very large shopping centers, um, and you know there we didn't. It was a great Walmart anchor project, but you know it really didn't have an impact. Uh, it, you didn't rally the community around this new great. Walmart Power Center. It's so different in sports. And so when a team or a community is able to acquire a a professional franchise uh, because of the investment um, of of some some of the leading, you know, business people within the community, it rallies the entire community. And there's so many things today, um, whether you're talking about politics, uh, people are divided on. But there's sports is one of the remaining common elements that, you know, once or twice a week, everyone comes together and comes together as a community, whether you're Republican or Democrat, um, uh, no matter what industry the uh, the companies in the community are, they're coming together to support their local uh, their local club. And now with the USL launching the, the Super League, um, there's so, so much interest in communities also not only having men's soccer, but having professional uh, women's soccer. And so we'll be the first league that has an, has an equal base pay structure for, for men and women. And companies get behind that, fans get behind that, and community leaders get behind that. Um, and like we say, you know, every game is a two hour commercial for the city. So you really get to achieve your financial goals. Um, And I think, again, we have a proven track record, but you get to do more Um, and you really get to invest in the community. And with our developments that we're doing, we're bringing, you know, 
millions and billions of dollars of economic impact, jobs, and again, building something that the community can can really be proud of um, and have a place for them to come together. So for me, that's the most fun part about my job is being able to just rally the entire community around these investments. And you really can't do that um, in other alternative assets. Yeah, for sure. And that's that's a good point you brought up. I, I had that noted down to ask about if it was um, if it was a dual gender league or not. So that's awesome that you have a, a women's division as well. Um, by growing up in Tallahassee, um, FSU's women's soccer just was amazing to watch. Those girls can really play. Um, my dad and I would watch them way over watching the men's soccer team, um, but they're always in the NCAA uh, tournament. So um, that's awesome that you have women's soccer. It's it's a great game, um, no matter which gender you're watching um, and probably should watch more of it. And maybe after this, I'll get more involved in uh, watching more soccer. But I want to really thank you for taking time out of your day. I know you are extremely busy uh, with doing that. Uh, if people want to get in touch with you or learn more about, um, you know, investing in this type of, um, you know, arena for no pun intended, um, you know, how can they get in touch with you? So, uh, you know, on, on LinkedIn, Twitter, um, you know, just set, send, send me a DM. Uh, and, you know, again, my, my, my team and I were, were in our communities every day. Um, and so, if, again, you, you fit those criteria of, of wanting to invest in your community and like um, and, and want to invest in, the, in, in soccer and in sports, uh, you know, we definitely like to have the conversation. Fantastic. Well, uh, Justin, thank you very much for being on with us today. Again, my name's Alex Perney. This is the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast, and thank you for joining. Thank you for tuning in to the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. Tune in next week for more investing tips and strategies. Want to hear more episodes of the Alternative Investing Advantage? Search podcast at advantaira.com and subscribe.